Osiris. Spotlight On is brought to you by Light, the technology platform reimagining e commerce for live events. You can learn more about Light at light.com forward slash partnerships. That is L Y T E dot com forward slash partnerships. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on Sydney, Australia-based musician, composer, and record label head Jeremy Rose. Jeremy joined me to discuss one of his most recent projects, Disruption, The Voice of Drums, which is a collaboration with drummers Simon Barker and Chloe Kim, along with Jeremy's own Earshift Orchestra. Disruption was born out of the political, environmental, and ecological turmoil of recent years and highlights the role of the drums as the backbeat of protest and action. Jeremy took us through that project and several other aspects of his busy creative life. I hope you enjoy. Thank you for making time to do this. I'm very grateful. Pleasure. Congratulations on the Arts Music Award. That's very exciting. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that was fantastic to get some recognition. I want to talk a bit about disruption, but I was hoping that maybe we could start with a couple of things that stood out for me in your biography that I, when I was reading about you. One of the things, there was a line that said, you work at the intersection of socioculture and genre. I don't want to make assumptions about what that should mean. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about about what that does mean for you and your work and what it causes you to bring to your work that you might not otherwise. I, did I say that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, sure, I think I, I really cross a lot of genre and stylistic boundaries, but I think when I use that term socioeconomic, I was speaking or at least referring to my last two major projects, Disruption, The Voice of Drums, and Iron in the Blood, which was a musical work that incorporated two actors. And it was a, a musical adaptation of a, of a book on well, the most widely known book on Australia's founding. And I guess it was sort of just challenging some of the ideas around Australian cultural identity and who we are and, and perhaps it might inform where we're going. So not all my work is is kind of politically engaged. It's kind of just been those those two large scale projects. What causes you to bring sort of a social purpose element into your work? How do you move through the world? Are you a political person? Are you an engaged person? How does that make its way into your art? I think as artists, it's really important to engage with society and, and reflect who we are. I mean, there's the age old saying of art should be like a mirror to society and re reflect what, what's happening. I think it's important for us to be engaged and to be projecting ideas about how we want society to be shaped. I, I think as an artist, we have a platform to speak our mind about politics and engage with historical events. The fact that you phrase it that way, that you have a platform, do you does that imply you feel a responsibility or you like you would like to have a responsibility for using that platform in this way? I think we we have a responsibility whether we <laughs> whether we like it or not. I mean we <laughs> the reach of our art enables us to engage with this this content in in a more meaningful way. So I think it's I think it's important in regards to engagement, are you are you able to still be a listener of music or have you fallen into that area of now you do the thing you love and so you lose the thing that you love? You know, are are you a fan still? Are you a are you a receiver of music? Certainly. I mean there's there's I guess a, a stock of albums that I'll happily put on the background if I'm cleaning the house or doing the cooking or that sort of thing. You know, running a record label means that I'm I'm sent a lot of music to to listen to and check out. I guess you could say that's that's part of my job. Yeah, and of course, listening to to my own 
content, my own mixing throughout the creative process. You've got, you know, you're, you're listening to a wide range of, of music to draw influences and inspiration and all that sort of thing. But music is such an important part of my life that I can't help but yeah, I'm addicted, you know. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, music is, is such an important part of my life that I can't help but always come back to it. It is important to have breaks in, and, and also give your ears a rest. But yeah, I mean, I'm always going to be drawn to music, whether I like it or not. What was your music growing up? What were you into? What were you surrounded by? It's, it's, it's always interesting when I talk to, and I'll use air quotes, even though our listeners can't see them, of, uh, you know, someone who works in the realm of serious music. I always love to understand where did you come from, even as a younger person? Was your first music high art or were you listening to pop culture and things like that? I was fortunate to be, to be brought up in a, in a house that was filled with a wide listening habit. My parents, they were drawn to music such as folk music, classical, non-Western music, you know, Indian classical music, and of course, a lot of jazz, blues, and not, you know, within the, the broad church of jazz, I would say that listen to quite a, a range of styles within that, that genre. You know, I think that has really just given me a, a open mind to styles and it's really informed my creative process and, and, and output today. Well, to turn our attention a little bit to disruption, I'm really curious about the disruptive power of the drum. I mean, that's, that's quite a statement. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of unique power and the unique nature of the drum, especially as, you know, as a horn player, what draws you there? What is the disruptive power and what's seductive about it? <laughs> the drums forms an elemental part of cultural expression. It's used in ancient rituals, ceremonies. It's been used in religious contexts for time immemorial. More recently, it's been a, an important part of music whose purpose has been to disrupt We've just been through one of the most disruptive periods in recent history with civil unrest, the, the global pandemic, growing ecological disaster. The drums has been a really vital component of, of that music from the streets where we hear people banging on drums. It's often accompanied by, by chanting and, and all, the, all the protests that we've seen all over the, the, in North America, in Hong Kong. And in Thailand and, and Russia, we've seen it used in, in hip hop music. And I mean, if we look at <laughs> Kendrick Lamar's music, the drums is, is just such an important part of, of, of that music. And so I really wanted to, to celebrate the, the power of the instrument here in Australia. We're, we're really lucky to, to have an amazing exponent of, of the instrument, Simon Barker, who's, Whilst first in jazz, he's, he's been studying the, the music of East Asia or well, the traditional shaman music of East Asia and, and the Pacific. He's one of the, the leading, leading drummers in the world. So I've always really wanted to, to collaborate with him in a, in a more significant way, as well as one of his former students, Chloe Kim, who's now really created a, a unique voice of her own. And the two of them have, have released a number of solo drum records. So I I essentially took their music and arranged kind of a soundtrack uh, which sort of foregrounded their, their solo drum recordings with an eight-piece electroacoustic orchestra and they recomposed their parts over the top of that. So we came up with something entirely new. Oh, interesting. So you had their original foundation, you composed over it, then they sort of pulled out the foundation and reintegrated. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's an interesting mm -hmm. process. As a composer... Outside of this project, where does rhythm come in for you generally? You know, are you, first of all, at what instrument do you typically sit down to compose at? And then does it start with a melody? Like, you know, of, all, of the various elements of a composition, where do you typically begin? Well, I have a background in, in piano. I started my music education on piano, so I'm fortunate 
to have the facility to be able to compose at the piano. I mean, yeah, actually, you could get away without much technique and still be able to write amazing music. But yeah, I mean, I I I love I love to to write at the piano and. I like to work on various elements at a time, harmony, melody, but also really I like to think about ways to extend form, structure, dynamics, mm. and, and explore other extended techniques and articulation, that sort of thing. So yeah, usually I'm improvising at the piano and something will, will stick with me and, and I guess I get, you know, what they say, the kick of the horse or whatever, and, and I can... Um, I like to record myself improvising and with with this recent project, a lot of it came through recording improvisations, transcribing and then arranging that material. Could you tell me a little bit about the live presentation of Disruption? Because obviously I'm, I'm very far from you, so I, I don't know if and when I'll get the opportunity to see it. But from what I've seen online, it's spectacular and very multidimensional. So I'd love if you could talk a little bit about how you came to have such a rich, multifaceted live presentation. What about this project lends itself to that for you? As I mentioned, the, the drums are foregrounded in this in this project musically, but I also wanted to capture that idea on stage. So the the two drummers are set up at the front of the stage with the rest of the ensemble sort of in a U shape around the back. And we have an audiovisual component. So we, we collaborated with two video artists, Paul uh, Mosick and Rachel Peachy, who created some stunning moving visuals that reacted with the audio. We drew upon some images from, from protests from around the world, not, not just North America, but, you know, Hong Kong, as I, as I mentioned. And, and they created a whole range of, I'd like to say, organic video material. A lot of it was quite earthy and a lot of moving things in water and smoke. There's this kind of ritualistic element in the music and also this kind of, yeah, immersive experience that we really tried to capture in the, the visual component. And I think that that came through in the live presentation. I would say that seeing these drummers perform live and each, we, we've been fortunate to present it twice now, once at the Sydney Festival and just a few weeks ago at the Melbourne International Jazz Festival. Each time we've performed it, it's changed somewhat. As, as I said, the, the drummers have sort of recomposed their parts, but they've, <laughs> they're getting better and better every time we perform it. So it's really quite compelling to, to witness that. Is it something that will be presented again and again over time or is this a very discreet project and then it will be what it is no certainly we, we're hoping to to bring this this project to a few places um well we're, we're pitching to europe south korea and you know we'd love to bring it to the states so fingers crossed we can make that happen yeah please do please do it's very exciting it's enough to simply watch master drummers at work and percussionists you know without the immersive presentation you create but that just at least the way it's captured on video, it's very, you could, you could feel the visceral nature of it. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. Thank you. There were elements of other music that, that sort of resonated for me when I, when I was experiencing the music of disruption and something that it evoked for me, I, and I, I'm happy being completely off base with this, but I felt I wanted to tell you, I felt I, I heard a strand of, of some of the later Henry Threadgill projects. The way he, I don't know, I think of like propulsion just as a, as a component of some of his music, very muscular. And I felt like I could hear a little bit of that, not only in, in the, the horn tones, but just the, the music had a brawniness to it that it was evocative of Henry Threadgill for me. And I, I'm not asking you to comment necessarily. I just wonder right, if, right, if, right. if how that speaks to you at all. <laughs> Hopefully it's not offensive. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, no, thank, thanks for those comments. Yeah. I, it was necessary to to have that energy to be able to kind of match what was happening on the on the drums and of of course the art ensemble and ASCM all those artists I mean that they're, they're a, a big influence on on me and 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 a lot of the artists that are in the ensemble so I guess it's it's natural for for that to kind of <laughs> come through elements of rock and uh, I mean there's a track that that kind of reminds me of the the Jack Johnson Miles record but it it has an unusual twist because it 
there's actually a, a Korean drum pattern ha- happening underneath, and especially as a as a double with a dr- double drama format, it has a real <laughs> primal energy in it. So yeah, I'm glad that came through. We'll be back with more Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media, after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. I, I was also intrigued by some of the, the scholarly work you do. I was reading your piece on the next about the nature. I, I, I hope I'm capturing this correctly, but mm. or at least where it led me to was like the nature of a long-term ensemble, right? And I wonder... Just for you, as a as a composer and as a as a performing artist, how do you feel about a long term project or a long term team of collaborators? And is the Earshift Orchestra meant to be a static group? Are they a collective? Do you intend people to come in and out, or is it is this your attempt to have a fixed ensemble? I'm, I'm just curious about how the nature of of that of like a a long-term collaboration appeals to you and what it means to you. So I guess you're referring to my article in uh, Critical Studies of Improvisation, I think it was. So, yeah, I, I mean, the next is a real phenomenon that they've managed to stick together so long. I mean, who else has stuck together for, what, <laughs> over 30 years? I think their music in particular has has allowed them to continually sort of reinvent themselves and bring in so many different sources of inspiration and approaches to music without losing their core identity of long form improvisation. They're a real inspiration, and I I, I think it's 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 almost Im, impossible to <laughs> replicate that kind of long term collaboration. For me, the Earshift Orchestra is set up as a vehicle to collaborate with a, a, a whole range of artists and really challenge different generations within the Australian and the, the wider Asia-Pacific region. The last two projects or two albums of the Earshift Orchestra have been quite different ensembles and it will continue to, to change for the next project. But I am involved in a long-term collaboration that's been together for over 10 years, The Vampires, and that's a four-piece ensemble and we've released six albums and we're actually we have a new album coming out next year which is a collaboration with chris abrahams the pianist from the next funnily enough um <laughs> and the actually the single is the first single from that album is actually out today on all good streaming platforms but that group even so it, we're into our third basis because they they <laughs> two of them have have moved overseas and it's just been impossible to keep it keep the group together i mean the next is just one of a kind i guess I mean, that's an incredibly prolific run, six albums in, in 10 years, given that you do so much other work. I mean, you're a working artist. You're not off in a monastery somewhere contemplating and then... <laughs> no, well, it's, um, it's been important to, to document that group. I guess one advantage of being in a, a co-led ensemble group is that we, we share all the, all the duties of, of getting an album out there and touring and booking gigs, booking all the, all the logistics and, and taking care of all that. So that's been one, one reason why we've been able to be, keep the momentum up with, with the album releases. But, you know, there's another Australian group, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, who, I mean, they, they dropped, what, five albums last year and three albums this year. I mean, the mind boggles how they managed to do that. I think I saw a stat that said they, they have something like 25 albums or something like that. I mean... Good luck being a fan. I don't know how you consume it all. Yeah, (laughs) it's unbelievable. I have not dug deeply into the catalog. I'm hopeful it's all of a high standard. It's not just simply putting stuff out, but it's incredible. Either way, just to just to have that many ideas is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned that that you've had multiple bass players come through the ensemble, and I wonder is that a is that a phenomenon? In Australia, do people feel that they need to leave to sort of find their their career path? Or is there enough of a, is the world big enough there to make a career and make a living? Or is it that at some point folks just feel like they have to go? No, I think it's probably easier to live as an artist in many ways in, in Sydney than it might be in New York. Or at least there's <laughs> there's not as much competition. There's certainly challenges to kind of breaking through into that wider 
music industry or internet building an international name for yourself and and being able to live just off performing touring and and recording i think it's important for artists of of any location to travel broadly and build up life experiences so i think it's a nat- it's a natural process for for us all to to want to travel overseas and and experience um places before the pandemic i was traveling to to new york and and europe berlin in particular once or twice a year i've been fortunate to do to do residencies in in a lot of places as as well in london and norway oslo of all places and greece so i think that's that's definitely um created or at least provided me a rich kind of understanding of of how artists from other localities operate and how how i also given me a, a new perspective on how i want my music to sound and perhaps give me a, a renewed appreciation of the points of difference of of where i come from and what what i can offer to that broader music legacy but yeah i think we have to take advantage or at least make the most of the opportunities that that present us of living in a far in a in a location such as sydney i mean i guess we're we're not bound by some of the traditional shall i say the 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 pressure of breaking traditional rules or you know i guess we're not bound by some of those responsibilities to an art form i guess we're allowed a bit more freedom here that's interesting when you say allowed you find that there's a willing audience who to go on the journeys with you certainly and we build our own scenes here and it's it's very much a, a grassroots or at least for me it started at a grassroots level but i'm fortunate to have, have built up a kind of an an ecosystem here in 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 australia that that's that's been really supportive of of my music as well as my my collaborators and and others on the scene and you know as i mentioned i've i've been running this this record label eshift music since 2009 and it's it's really exciting to be able to champion the original voices that have emerged on the Australian scene. What was the impetus to to do that? I mean, I, I would imagine you 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 flex a slightly different set of muscles as a record label owner and different responsibilities, but I guess my question's why? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. Um I had a release on a on an artist run label, Jazz Groove Records, and the distributor went bust. I guess it was at that time when there was a major shift in, in the music industry and record labels and distributors were all taking a, a big hit. So I had I had three projects with separate collaborations and, and bands and we <laughs> we needed an outlet. So I started the the label essentially to release my own projects and, and collaborations. And it grew to the point where friends were we're starting to send me albums and now artists from all around Australia and, and also artists that I'm associated with who are living overseas in, in London, New York and, and Japan have been sending me records to release. So it's, it's really exciting to be, to be able to champion those, their, their music and build an audience around that. In the world of new music and of modern composers and jazz and improvised music, what role does a label play like are you are you funding somebody to go into the recording studio or are they delivering you a finished good and then you're just what promoting like what what does it mean to be a record label in that part of the ecosystem well i think the deal so-called record deal uh is <laughs> has changed is this where you get the cigar out and you smoke the big cigar <laughs> and put your feet up <laughs> The record deal has changed so much. I mean, even the major labels, their idea of a record deal, I, I, I don't even know if it <laughs> really exists anymore, but at least for Earshift music, it's we're really acting as a, a promotion tool and kind of a an, an agency that, that has helped connect artists with a, a promotional platform and facilitated them with with getting the music out there in a well presented format we really are delivering impact for their release rather than an artist having to do it themselves we're we're also fortunate to be given some financial support to really help with our international campaigns at, more recently which has been a, a real game changer 
know, I think there's a, there's a real space for for a label to to step forward and champion the music of our region, just as labels such as it, you know ECM did in the in the early days, and and Edition Records are, are doing now, and International Anthem out of Chicago. They're our main our biggest inspirations and, and models for, for labels. So I hope to, to build it into something along those, those uh, models. What do you think is the special thing, if anything, that you bring to the role being both an artist and now a, a business person? I know what good music sounds like, or at least the artists that are, are released on the, the label are, are important and their music is music that's striving to create something new and exciting. And so I've been able to put a stamp on the vision for the label that, that I think people can recognize now and they're willing to give future releases a, a listen because I've hopefully developed a bit of a, a sound for the label. And that's, that's yeah. really what, what has been the driving force from the beginning. Yeah, when you, when you said you put a stamp on the label, I wonder is that how overt is that? Is it an aesthetic? Is it a philosophy you know how does that manifest yeah I, I think it's a it's an aesthetic mostly appreciating a type of artist that has really strived to to say something in their music it's not just a presentation of um they're not just playing standards on on the releases jazz standards it's it's more than that i mean perhaps you've already answered this but Composition and innovation in composition seems important to you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, for sure, hundred percent. Jazz music, whilst whilst we, I guess we call it a jazz label. You know, jazz music can mean anything these days. Yeah, and I think it's most importantly, it's it's a it's a process of making music that has embraced some form of innovation and attempt to disseminate the boundaries of of music <laughs> in some way and like i said could be cultural cultural stylistic or other music processes that they've they've interrogated in some way yeah i mean i think it's an exciting moment to be a jazz fan or to be a a, a fan of of modern composers or instrumental music there's just so much interesting music right now that that is um and i don't know if that's the internet, the streaming services, but there, it just seems there's no shortage of, of wonderful music to keep discovering. And I felt for a long time to discover that I would have to look backwards. And it's so nice to be surrounded with it in a more contemporary fashion. But it's also interesting to me, specifically to jazz, you know, so much of the innovation 40, 50 years ago was around the move to electroacoustic and, and ele you know, and electronic instruments. How many people went in that direction? For better or worse, it played out in some extremes and then other areas, you know, they they continue to innovate. Like it, it's just, it was what it was. No, no qualitative statement there. And then there were people who innovated through composition and things of that nature. And these aren't discrete buckets, obviously, you know, there's, there's overlapping, but probably listeners have, have heard me talk about more than once. I'm a McCoy Tyner fan. I'm a piano player. I know nowhere near McCoy, but you know, I'm, a, he's my, he's my guy in my pantheon. And he's always been interesting to me because his innovation struck me more around arrangement. He never went electric, which I which still boggles my mind. Like there, he never went electric with the instrument that would have been the most obvious in that era. Right. Yeah. Some great compositions, but his his records, the way they were so different in terms of arrangements and the and the ensembles he put together and the African influence or strings or what have you. It's amazing how there's all those there's all those aspects of music and they and they they all lend themselves to their own innovation, their own excess even. And I and it's interesting to me that your gravitational pull is at the compositional side. I wonder do you like to experiment with form and do you how does how do you think about arrangements and I'm curious how all that settles in for you. Well, I think composition really allows you to explore numerous musical identities and i'm driven by the variety and nature of, of musical activity that's kind of just beyond my own aesthetic borders you know my own my own tastes and, and inclinations so i'm just driven by continued curiosity to explore and create 
new forms of music. And I think composition allows you to really create platforms to kind of explore those those various ideas and concepts and and have fun with them. <laughs> and of course, approach them through my own prism of of musical processes, which is whatever my musical instincts are and 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 of course in a i'm fortunate to be a a performer and a composer so there's that element that plays into it too i think i've been creating a lot of music these this this past 10 years you know i guess i'm up to perhaps over 20 20 albums or so various projects and collaborations and and i think perhaps it might be time for me to to explore arranging or at least take someone else's music and and explore it a little uh, interrogate it in the same way but um thanks for planting that seed maybe that... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take my producer's fee <laughs> yeah that's it i have to ask then since you 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 raised the point what would be an artist whose whose repertoire or whose whose songbook you would want to spend that kind of time with and make that kind of emotional and artistic investment in that's a tricky question and uh, it does feel a bit um, unfair to ask yeah I, I bet you i could ask every day and get a different answer well i don't yeah i don't want to re- also reveal uh my uh yeah, <laughs> my secret the secret project that I've got <laughs> brewing but um i think there's so many so many artists that i'd like to explore i mean i've been looking at paul motion's electric bebop band recently and i think you know that i love that approach of taking those melodies and and sort of uh, well playing them with a contemporary band and just doing your yeah. <laughs> you know uh reinventing them i loved rudresh mantapa's uh, bird calls album what he did to charlie parker's music he's something else rudresh oh my god i know i know i love wayne shorter i think there's there's so much scope still to ex- further explore his music but you know it might be nice to to take someone that's that's kind of a less obvious yeah figure as well so i've got a i've got a, a drawing board of, of ideas and i'm going to keep adding to it i'm not quite at the at the stage of taking on my next project but i guess i'm i'm a transitional stage there's there's been so many projects that have taken shape during the pandemic and I'm, I'm just i've got another two or three albums that are coming out in the next six months so once all that's happened i'll, I'll um i'll get back to you I have one other quick question. It's sort of process related before I let you go. And I'm wondering what role, what role the studio plays in your work and, and more broadly, sort of your tools and technology. Are they simply tools at your disposal or is the studio a member of the band? You know, like how, how do you, how do you think about and, and interrelate with technology? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, jazz has traditionally well, jazz recordings have have traditionally been all about trying to capture that that live element. It's it's impossible to replicate like a quartet recording, for example. All of my quartet recordings have been a studio recording of a, a live performance. You know, we might be in separate booths, but essentially that's that's what happened in in real time. There's been little overdubbing, but more recently with with projects such as Disruption. And also more recently with like the most recent album of the vampires with Chris Abrams, we've, we've really taken advantage of the possibilities of being able to layer, create layers of bed tracks and overdubbing techniques. In fact, with disruption, it was born out of necessity because we couldn't all fit in the, we couldn't have two separate drum rooms with a live band with the six piece ensemble at the same time in the studio that we'd selected. They really only had sort of two main rooms to record in. So a lot of the drum tracks were, were laid down first. We recorded with that, but some of those tr- drum tracks had to be kind of synced or at least cut up with various sections that were cued or we might have used a time code in the, in the composition to create the, the necessary sections so we've really taken advantage of 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 the overdubbing possibilities which is uh, kind of been a revelation i think it's gonna certainly change the future concept albums for me because well i guess it changes the whole creative process and i know having having done this research project with the next they haven't released a, a live album in i can't remember what it was maybe 10 years or at least their last 10 
albums have been studio productions, they will often just start with one person just creating <laughs> like an hour of improvisations and then the compositional process is is really in the studio overdubbing layer after layer and then later editing those those tracks into some sort of musical structure and, and shape. So it's it's really interesting wow. how that works. That's really amazing. Well, thank you for spending time with me. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. It's been great chatting. And before we go, will you say the name of the new track that hit today? Because we'll be coming out in the next few days and I want to make sure people know what to go look for. Great. Yeah. So if you look up The Vampires and it's featuring Chris Abrahams and the track is is called Khan Shater, which is spelt K-H-A-N-S-H-A-T-Y-R. Khan Shatir. Khan Shatir. I'm going to make sure I go listen to that when we, uh, when we get off this. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy Rose. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On. We're presented by Osiris Media and brought to you by Light. Executive producers are Lawrence Purrier, Ant Taylor, Brian Brinkman, RJB, and Matt Dwyer. Spotlight On is produced by Craig Snyder, with post-production by Michael Donaldson, and theme music by q Abstract Message. If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Visit us online at SpotlightOnPodcast.com or at SpotlightOnPod on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Osiris. Oh,